All right, well, hello everyone. We'll go ahead and get started. Uh, welcome or welcome back to this, our final day in uh, this webinar series on the role of computational geoscience in the predictive assessment of plate boundary systems and hazards. I'm Allison Duval from the University of Washington. I'm an SE4D MCS, that's Modeling Collaboratory for Subduction Steering Committee member, and I'm gonna be one of the moderators for this morning's session. Um, as you are hopefully aware, the MCS has teamed up with CIG and CSDMS to put on this webinar series that has had six sessions in two short series uh, in total. All of these are recorded and are or will soon be available uh, on the MCS RCN website. Uh, you can find that URL here. So today's main speaker will be Katie Barnhart from the USGS Landslide Program. But before I, am, I formally introduce Katie um, and give her a chance to give her talk, which will be about testing surface process models with numerical experiments, I'm going to give the audience a chance for approximately, uh, or we already have the questions, but we're going to give about five to 10 minutes um, of Q&A for Susanna uh, Bouter, who's was yesterday's speaker and unfortunately due to technical difficulties um, we were cut off in the webinar um, during the Q&A portion so we want to make sure to give some time to address some great questions from the audience for that um, so I'm going to stop sharing my screen for this um, and um, I'm going to uh, ask um, uh, pose some of these questions for Susanna and Susanna if if it's needed, you can also share your screen in answering or you can just answer the question um, as we go. So the first question um, was in your models, the sediment is locally derived clastic sediment. If South Atlantic salt allows rapid sedimentation, um, but high thermal conductivity of salt. So other places may have distal sediments, perhaps South China Sea with Himalayan sediments. It seems like this might provide opportunities for wide margins. Yeah, that's a very good point, actually, um, because in, in the models that I, <laughs> I showed yesterday, um, they, they are 2D um, and the service process model I have means that the sediments are uh, deposited or eroded with, within the section. But of course, you, you could very well have um, a sediment source out of plane. Um, and and as, um, as I find that with increased sedimentation, we have a tendency to create more white rifted margins. So, it's definitely, you know, it, it might, for some regions, increase the chance for white margins, but the region where the sediment comes from <laughs> might have less chance to become a white margin. Yeah. Um, so the next um, question is, I think I don't understand the surface equation. It contained dh over dx, but that would mean that the surface height change may be positive or negative, depending on whether the surface slopes to the left or to the right. Is this really what you use? Um, I'll just quickly share the equation and I've, I've taken the chance to correct it. Um, because that's a good point. So, so the equation, as I put it up yesterday, has, has a change in height with time. Um, it depends on, on, on the slope and the coefficient, but the slope should be the absolute slope. So, and, and there is no um, directionality in that sense. Um, so that's a, that's a good point. Okay, great. Thanks for that uh, clarification. That's great. Um, Susanna, great talk. In one of your slides, did you show that the lower crust flows upslope, i.e. against gravity? Um, not that I can recall, but the, the one, one, one <laughs> yeah. difference is that um, um, the, the, the colors of the models that I was showing, they are lithology and not necessarily the rheological phase. So, so you can see material moving, but we should, um, Another way of looking at it is that we actually check which material is behaving viscous. And then if you, if you push hard enough, things will go up slope too. Mm -hmm. yeah. All right, the next question was, what gaps in field data do you see for these coupled tectonic surface process models? Yeah, that's a great question. <laughs> I mean, one, one of the um, a data set that I would love to have is seismic data. Where, where people, where it's a, like a, a comprehensive set for different continental rifted margins, where there is actually a distinction between what was deposited before rifting, during rifting and after, so that we know which sediments are linked to the actual rifting process. Um, and onshore, it would be great to have relative 
materials versus when did the main tectonic phase take place. But I think these are kind of grand wishes <laughs> that will take, um, I mean, people working on seismic data I've talked to have said that this will be a lot of work. Yes, but I think you're right. Um, it's it's good, you know, this is the, the right place for us, I think, to be sort of having these grand visions and really laying out what, what what's needed in the future, I think. Um, so just a few more questions here. Um, the next one says, uh, great talk, uh, Susanna, thanks. You mentioned you model erosion as a function of the slope, but I missed how you model deposition. Is it by adding horizontal layers in the concave up part of the landscape, the basin? Um, is the eroded deposited mass conserved? Um, so, so the erosion and sedimentation follow the same equation. So the only difference is that below a certain level, which I take to be sea level, it will be deposited and above it, it will be eroded. Um, and it's not mass balanced, which is, I mean, in a way, I don't worry about it because materials could be coming from out of plane. Um, but if I take, for example, a diffusive one, and a lot that depends on curvature, then, then it would be mass balancing. Um, I mean, the reason I, I chose this equation was that I wanted the sediments to deposit close to the, the continental margin. And some of the models I was looking at, they, they put the sediments way out until the mid-ocean reach, and we, we don't see that. Um, so, but I, I know that the equation is uh, far from perfect. And, and I, it would actually be really interesting to, to talk to people, you know, so, so that we, yeah, the, to have a collaboration with people who work on, on the landscape evolution side versus people like me who work from the tectonic site and step through the process, you know, with time step of 2,000, 10,000 year, overstep a lot. Um, and, and how we can actually bridge these time scales in a, in a useful manner. And um, uh, a couple more here or one more here. Um, let's see, maybe this is two questions, but um, another compliment of the talk. And then I would have thought erosion sedimentation would mainly affect mean lithostatic stress and not so much differential stresses if the material is not laterally confined. Do you see a change in different differential stress in your simulations? And is it sensitive to whether the code has compressible elasticity? Um, yeah, that's correct. So erosion and, and sedimentation, they, they change the vertical stress. Um, when, you, when you remove material, you reduce your, your overburden, you reduce the vertical stress and sedimentation does the reverse. Um, but what that means is that, say in the case of sedimentation, where you increase your vertical stress, um, you will need more differential stress to bring the material to failure. So, so your, your overall material becomes um, stronger. So it's um, not that you're increasing all the stress, you're increasing your vertical stress, but it means that you will need to apply a larger differential stress to bring it to failure. And in the case of erosion, you will need less differential stress to bring the material to failure. It will be easier to deform. Um, and what was the other question? Elasticity, right? Yeah, so yeah. the models that I showed were um, without elasticity because of the, the timing, the Maxwell relaxation time, the Deborah number. Um, and I wouldn't really know if you would I think because in the models, iron elasticity doesn't really play a role because of the time scale we're looking at. So, yeah, it wasn't the first thing I was going to test, but right. it, it could be interesting for things like like um, local responses, like like football uplift um, to processes. For for that, maybe I can't tell. Okay, well, that um, that was uh, all the questions that we had from yesterday, and we really appreciate. <laughs> Thank you, Susanna, for um, for tracking back with us to make sure that we got those answered because there was a lot of interest in the presentation, and um, I'm very glad we got got to do that. Um, and so, for now, I'm going to introduce uh, Katie Barnhart, uh, who will uh, be today's main speaker. So Katie Barnhart is a geomorphologist interested in using numerical models for prediction and hypothesis testing. Her work focuses on erosion and sedimentation hazards across the Earth's surface. She received her PhD in geological science from uh, the University of Colorado Boulder. Her primary affiliation currently is with the Landslide Hazard Program of the US Geological Survey. And she is also associated with the University of Arizona Department of Geosciences and the Cooperative Institute for Research and Environmental Sciences series at the University of Colorado Boulder. So we're gonna go ahead and give Katie some, um, some time to speak now, and then there'll be an opportunity
for Q&A uh, at the end of her presentation. And again, please go ahead and use the Q&A box to ask your question. You can type it in at any point, but we're gonna address it at the end. Take it away, Katie. Thanks, Allison. Um, I presume you can hear me and you can see my screen. Great. Well, um, thanks for the opportunity to talk uh, today. I'm really excited to sort of give you a sense of some of the work that um, I've been involved with testing service process models with numerical experiments. Um, and I'm, I'm going to give a um, sort of a taste of two examples today on two really different time scales and um, using two really different types of um, surface process models. So in the first part, I'm going to talk about a landscape evolution example where we're really thinking about the time frame from um, sort of 10,000 years ago to, sorry, 13,000 years ago to um, 10,000 years into the future. That is a, a typo there. Um, and then in the second part, we're going to talk about debris flow inundation, um, sort of an, an event on a few hour long time scales. Um, and so while neither of these is sort of deeply tectonically related, I, I think that the methods that I'm showing can be um, used to think about, you know, when it matters um, to tightly couple um, surface and tectonic models, sort of what fidelity of the um, representation of processes is necessary in either the surface or tectonic model. Um, and I also think that the examples show the type of result that we might expect. So I also want to sort of connect this work with this fundamental question that we have in geomorphology, to what extent we can infer, infer process from form. So, you know, on the left hand side, we see uh, um, an area in California, the Gabalon Mesa area, it looks fundamentally different from um, what's shown on the right, which is a glaciated valley that's to the west of Boulder. Um, and so, you know, the, in, in the earth surface processes, one of our fundamental observables is topography. And so, you know, we are often asking the question to what extent, you know, does this topography encode the information about um, the physical processes by which it, um, it came to be? Obviously, there is information in this topography. These, are, these surfaces look very, very different. You can sort of intuitively know that the one on the right was formed by glaciers, so although the one on the left was not, you know, but does, does, this topography tell us what the form of the governing equations for surface evolution is under certain um, environmental conditions. I also want to take a little bit of a step back and put forward sort of my conceptual way of thinking about using models for um, investigating uh, questions. So I, I think um, it's useful to remember that a model is a hypothesized simplification of a study system that at its core is linking some set of inputs to some set of outputs. And we use models when we cannot directly manipulate the true system, but we want to understand its behavior, either because the system is evolving over a time scale that is much longer than our lives, or that maybe we cannot directly sample it because it is deep below our feet. Um, and so a lot of my current work is, is um, thinking about how when we compare alternative models and really understand how models transform inputs to outputs, we can um, move forward in, in thinking about um, our models as hypotheses for um, the, the real system and understanding their limits for making predictions. So, with that, uh, I want to talk about this first uh, case study of landscape evolution. Um, I want to note this work has recently been published in a series um, at its core of four papers in JGR Surface. So today I'm really just going to give you a taste of sort of the setup and some of the types of results that we get. And if um, you want to learn more, um, it's possible to learn more in the literature. 
So um, for this work, um, I was part of a, a team of people who was tasked with making predictions of erosion 10,000 years in the future in a place in Western upstate New York located around the location of the red dot. Um, and in this area, so there's a um, topography is sort of shown in this main image. There are three main domains. In white, there's Devonian uh, shale bedrock. In orange, there's a glacial till. And in green is the um, river system that has cut into that glacial till um, most recently since deglaciation 13,000 years ago. We're gonna focus on the watershed that's outlined in blue because um, at you know, the approximate location of these pink unicorns is a nuclear waste reprocessing facility that's no longer operational. And so we can sort of see this reprocessing facility from, from the sky in this image here. And um, in blue is sort of the main trunk stream where we've had about 50 meters of erosion over the past 13,000 years, which has then sort of launched off a series of um, um, adjacent channels um, cutting into the facility. So, it, you know, it'd be reasonable to want to know um, how much erosion is going to happen in the future for things like remediation. So how did we approach making these predictions? First, um, we need an appropriate model. In our case, we consider multiple alternatives. Fortunately, we have well-constrained uh, time period, initial conditions, boundary conditions, those um, streams. Um, and we need a basis for uh, assessing performance, which we'll call the objective function. I'll tell you what that is in detail in a few minutes. Um, we did a sensitivity analysis first to get a sense of sort of broad um, relation between our model input parameters and our, our objective function. We calibrated um, this set of models we used, um, validated them, and then we did a prediction experiment. So I'll, today I'll talk um, a little bit about the sort of setup of the multiple alternative models, what the objective function was. I'll show some calibration results and some prediction results. So in this case, we use um, what we call landscape evolution model. It represents the change in surface elevation through time, mostly um, by the erosion of streams and gravitational transport. Um, in big letters, you can see an example of a of the simplest governing equation that we use. Um, and this has two free parameters, K, which sort of represents the um, efficiency of um, erosion by streams, and D representing the sort of um, how diffusive the gravitational transport is. Um, and what we did is, you know, we sort of conceptually broke this up and said, well, we, we might have a different functional form for the erosion by water. We might have a different functional form for the erosion by gravity. We might have um, slightly different uh, hydrology, which would influence more, you know, in this form here, what the um, drainage area term here looks like. And then we might want to rec recognize that um, there are different materials. We, we might first consider all uniform materials or um, recognize that we have a glacial till and, and a shale. So what we did was come up with um, as many plausible sort of binary changes that we could make in these um, four categories um, and, and have sort of a simple option, which is represented by that uh, equation I showed previously. Um, or a more complicated option. And um, in the, the case of, um, you know, we, we didn't, we weren't able to uh, make every single combination, um, but um, we made 37 um, combinations sort of representing all of um, choosing one of these uh, more, um, all of one of these options and um, then a, um, most of the sort of um, two, two uh, complexity options and then one three complexity option. And so to connect with 
what Greg was talking about um, on Tuesday and the software LAN lab that Nicole um, introduced. We use two pieces of cyber infrastructure um, for this work. Um, one of them is a model a Python package called Terrain Bento, which implements these 37 alternative models and it's built on top of LAN lab. So what we can do is compare um, two different uh, models that differ only in one aspect of their model structure. So for example, we can um, consider two models that differ only in um, their gravitational transport um, option. You know, they could have a, a linear uh, rule for the relationship between local slope and sediment flux or nonlinear rule. We can see how they compare and then we can um, evaluate, you know, is the um, potential improvement that comes from using a more complex um, formulation, you know, does it work? Is it worth the extra free parameter that you have and so forth? So how do we um, compare our models and data? What we did um, was compare the end of model run and modern topography. So we would run simulations from 13,000 years ago when we have well-constrained topography to the present day. And um, what we did is divide the landscape into 20 sets, which are each shown um, with a different color in this figure on, on the right. And each patch would get a misfit score. And then the objective function is the sum of squared patch misfits. So really this represents um, sort of a, a misfit of the um, modern and end of model run topography but we give a little more emphasis, more importance to the um, smaller patches, ones that are near the, um, the river and also near the, the waste site. So each model was independently calibrated using a hybrid optimization approach of our 37 models. We were successful in doing this with 34 of them. And we first used a global optimization method to find the approximate location of the um, model data, um, the parameters that minimize our model data misfit. And then we refined that um, with a gradient based method. And this um, we found worked for us. These models took about half an hour to run on a single core. And so um, this, this was a good sort of balance of um, using a statistical surrogate-based uh, method and um, a gradient-based method. So this is an example of the best model. I won't tell you exactly um, what additional ingredients were necessary to create it, um, it but um, the cumulative erosion is marked with red and um, if there's deposition, um, black, indicates deposition. Um, so um, how does this model run compare with the actual topography? So here on the left, we see the modern topography and on the right is the um, end of model run topography where the color has been um, used to indicate uh, purple is not enough erosion and orange indicates too much erosion. And so as you can see, there are areas um, where the model doesn't erode enough or where it erodes too much. But by and large, this is you know, pretty good and it, it creates topography that's pretty similar to modern topography. So let's put this model um, in the context of all the other uh, models and also the model with the most, the simplest um, set of options. So, this is going to um, eventually build to showing the results of the calibration. A dot is going to appear on the plot for each calibrated model, and the models are going to be ordered um, from best on the left to worst on the right. And the model misfit is on the y axis such that a low value indicates good performance. So each of the considered models has one or more of these process element complexities that I introduced earlier, and those are going to be shown by color. 
So the model that had all of the default options is shown in black. Um, and so what does that look like as an animation? Here we can see um, its animation and that it, it's eroding much more in the bedrock upland portion of the watershed. So this area here is underlined by um, the shale and down here um, we predominantly have the glacial till. And so this model has only two parameters and it was calibrated um, so that the model data misfit was minimized. If we um, look at it in the sort of same view as we saw previously, where we can, uh, we can see that it's over eroding in this um, upper portion of the watershed, um, and then it under, it's under eroding down here adjacent to the, um, the main streams. So let's go back to this figure where we're looking at all the different models results and um, add um, dots for all of the rest of the models. So one thing I want to note for those of you familiar with calibration, you might be wondering if this is all the default options, why are there some that are doing worse? Um, that is happening because in our case, we can't always fully reproduce um, this all default option with some of our model structure permutations. And so um, some of our elements of complexity are just not able to um, do as well as the all default option. So what we can see though, is that most of these um, models are improving upon this all default option, um, simplest model. One um, thing I'd like to draw your attention to is that there's something um, systematic in um, the best set of models, which is that they all, um, all differentiate between the Devonian bedrock and the glacial till. And then the best set of models, um, the, the best three, all use a um, threshold in the erosion of rivers uh, by rivers terms, such that in order for river erosion to occur, um, the slope and area combined need to exceed a threshold. The, um, so what I'm going to do next is show you sort of how we get to this best model, this one that has three elements and is shown um, here all the way on the left. So um, on the upper left, I'm showing the modern topography. And um, what you can see here is that I'll put on the uh, laser pointer. So this panel shows the um, all default option. Um, it improves um, when we add the ability to differentiate between the rock and the glacial till. Um, it improves even more when we allow it to have a uh, threshold in the river erosion. And then it um, improves again when we give it um, this uh, final piece of complexity, some um, a nonlinear rule for gravitational transport. So we can return to our um, animation here and um, see again how it does. So, you know, I think the, the thing to take away from this sort of approach is that, you know, by using a hierarchical set of models in which, you know, the, the governing equations of each model are varying very systematically, this really allows us to carefully identify um, when adding complexity um, adds value to the simulation and, and when it doesn't. Um, and it also allows us to hypothesize, you know, a whole suite of ideas about why um, a particular um, complexity might um, be used to better simulate it, a, um, a site and then really test that idea. So the last thing I wanna do before moving on to the second case study is show you some of the results from making uh, predictions um, for this site. So the experimental design for prediction um, 
considered three future down cutting scenarios. So the um, boundary condition of river erosion uh, downstream of the watershed, lowering the elevation of the watershed outlet. Um, three alternative climate future scenarios that were inspired by um, RCP scenarios. We chose the um, eight uh, best models. Uh, I can talk uh, in the Q&A about why we chose those eight, uh, but I'll also say that the results of choosing those eight is not that different than just choosing the single uh, best model. And then we um, varied the initial condition by adding some noise to the initial topographic surface um, to end up with um, a large number of model evaluations in a fully balanced experiment. And we used an ANOVA design to partition the variance that comes from um, each of these um, elements, from the uh, down cutting, from the climate, um, from the model structure, and then from the initial condition. So what does the predicted erosion look like? This animation shows the um, model ensemble prediction, so the average across all of those evaluations for the next 10,000 years at the study site. Brown is representing deposition and green represents erosion. So you can see that the erosion is dominantly focused in the main channels and the um, side slopes adjacent to those channels. Well, what does uncertainty in this uh, erosion look like through time? So here I'm going to show the total uncertainty, which um, here yellow is low uncertainty and purple is high uncertainty. And so not surprisingly, the majority of the uncertainty is in the area uh, where erosion is predicted to occur. And so what I think is really cool about this approach is that we can use this ANOVA analysis at every single one of these model grid cells to partition the uncertainty in each of the four components, which I now show here. So I'll note the color axis is the same on all of these panels. And so as we'd expect, the uncertainty grows in each component over the prediction time period. Um, variation in future climate, um, which is shown in the upper left, has a relatively small contribution and it's, it's focused on the main channel side slopes. The lowering of the watershed outlet has the largest uncertainty, but it's entirely focused on the lower reaches of the main uh, channel. So right, right in here. Um, and the initial condition uncertainty, this was a surprise for us. Um, you know, it really focuses along the edges of the plateau surfaces. And, and what's happening here is that variations in initial condition topography are steering drainage um, and thus allowing different gullies to dominate um, the incision of the plateau. And um, we can also see in the lower right that along the plateau edge and on the steep slopes, um, one of the, that's where we see uncertainty in the, the model structure. So one fascinating question that I think this brings up that I don't have a good answer to, unfortunately, yet is sort of what sort of field data could we use or might we expect to be successful in differentiating between um, sort of these models, which would allow us to reduce this um, model structure uncertainty. So to conclude this section, um, I hope I've convinced you that this formal model analysis approach um, can provide some insight into the complexity needed to capture the dynamics of a particular place, and that using this multi-model approach with a fully balanced experimental design can help constrain uh, the proportions of uncertainty attributable to the different um, alternative scenarios. So in the final about 15 minutes of this talk, um, let's discuss um, this second case study of debris flow inundation. Um, and here we're going to focus on um, the January 9th, 2018 Montecito debris flow event. So um, 
Montecito is located in uh, to the east of Los Angeles uh, between the Pacific Ocean and the Santa Ynez Mountains. And Highway 101 is going to run along its south side. And the alluvial fan to the south of the Santa Ynez Mountains is, is urbanized. So on December 4th, the um, of 2017, the Thomas fire started. And on the left, you can see the soil burn severity map for the portion of the Thomas fire um, that's to the north of Montecito. And most of the area was burned at moderate severity, which is shown in yellow. Uh, but moderate severity means that most of the trees have been fully burnt. On January 2nd, the US Geological Survey released a post fire debris flow hazard assessment. Um, and these hazard assessments combine information about the susceptibility of debris flows in order to identify how much rain it's going to take to initiate a debris flow and how big debris flows are likely to be, but they don't tell us where debris flows are likely to go. Um, and so the work I'll talk about today is going to focus on, you know, where, how do we construct um, predictions of where they're likely to go, you know, what models um, might we use? How do we test them? How do we calibrate them and so forth? So um, our timeline for this event um, now takes us from um, December 4th to January 2nd. On January 5th, in anticipation of a forecast storm, the National Weather Service issued an outlook for debris flows. Um, on January 8th, Santa Barbara County issued the largest ever evacuation orders. And in the early morning hours of January 9th, the Weather Service issued a warning, followed by a 50 year rainburst over Montecito with storm totals nearing 100 millimeters in some places. So this mobilized 680 cubic meters of sediment and the areas um, that were inundated by debris are now shown in gray, cutting through this urban, uh, urbanized alluvial fan. Boulders mobilized were up to four meters in diameter, and this resulted in 23 fatalities, over 167 injuries, and 408 damaged homes. In orange are the locations of houses which sustained damage between one and 50%, and in red are those with over 50% damage or complete destruction. So motivated and informed by this event, um, we're going to think about how we might make um, predictions of debris flow inundation. And similar to the last um, case study, we'll think about you know, what model, um, sort of um, what um, model is going to be sufficient for simulating inundation, what type of data is necessary, and what sorts of so what sources of uncertainty might be uh, necessary to consider? So um, I'm going to, the sort of scope of to this case study is a numerical modeling study in which I set up and run simulations of this inundation event with three candidate models um, that are going to vary in their representation of debris flow physics, RAMs, Flow2D, and DCLAW, and I'll introduce their um, nature in a few slides. We're going to assess model performance on the overlap between simulated and um, observed debris flow extent. We have measurements of depth, um, but today we're not going to consider them. And each model takes between two and 10 inputs, which I find useful to separate into um, two categories, the total volume of moving material and the sort of properties or flowability of that material. And today, we're just going to focus on volume. And so in addition to comparing the best simulation um, results for each model, we're going to ask how sensitive simula simulation results are to the volume inputs. And, and I think this is important because the volume of mobilized material is one of the largest sources of pre-event uncertainty. And so by exploring the sensitivity of the model to this um, input in a well-constrained experiment, we set ourselves up to think about how uncertainty in volume is going to propagate into inundation in a hypothetical pre-event context. 
So um, this slide goes over the three models we're considering, RAMs, FlowTD, and DCLOP. Uh, all the models solve depth average equations of motion for fluid, an example of which is shown in the animation. And there are two main distinctions between these models. First, DCLAW is more complex than the other models because instead of considering the movement of a single phase of material, it considers solid material embedded in the fluid phase and the interaction between those two phases. RAMs and Flow2D represent two alternative ideas for the shear rate versus shear stress relationship of the fluid, um, which are called the Golemi and quadratic rheologies. And RAMS has two parameters that control this relationship, whereas Flow2D has four. Um, and DCLAW requires more parameters to specify the sort of effective flowability of the material. And so I think similar to the last um, case study, comparing these models is, serves as a formal hypothesis test for representing the debris flow inundation physics. So I'm going to apply each of these models to two sites. The first is the Montecito Creek drainage, and the second is the San Ysidro Creek drainage. And these two sites are being treated separately because the field observations made after the event point to the conclusion that the sediment concentration in each of the two flows was really different. But today we're just going to talk about the Montecito Creek drainage. Uh, at each site and for each model, I run many simulations varying the input parameter values. And to do this, I first define the parameter space, sample it. And here we're going to sample it at least 100 times the number of input parameters um, to assess each simulation's performance. We're going to uh, today focus on the parameters that control volume. And because RAMs and Flow2D represent the flow of a single phase, there's only one parameter on the total volume of moving material. DCLAW, in contrast, considers two phases. So we have two parameters, the sediment volume and the sediment concentration, which combine um, to create the total volume. Um, an important anchor point we have is that field estimates for this, um, this part of the domain um, are for uh, about 230,000 cubic meters of sediment, but we're going to consider a pretty large volume range surrounding this value for a couple of reasons. First, there's uncertainty in this estimate, and second, we sort of want to understand how the models behave at a wide range of volumes. So how are we going to assess simulation performance? Our extent misfit metric, which is called modified omega t, represents the degree to which the simulated and observed inundated areas overlap. So when simulated in an uh, inundation area extent perfectly matches with observed, this yields a value of zero, best possible. And when simulated and observed are perfectly disjoint, it yields a value of two. So what do the results look like? Soon we will see some maps that compare simulated and observed inundation extent. Here are the results for RAMs. So in dark green is the true positive area where debris flow was both observed and simulated. In light green is the false positive area where debris flow was simulated but not observed. And in light brown is the area where debris flow was observed but not simulated. And I think one thing to note here is that the simulation matches of observations pretty well. What does this look like for Flow2D and DCLOP? You can see this now. Um, and I, I think, you know, one thing to take away is that the results are quite similar. Uh, but and many of the places where the simulations struggle are also similar. So there's overestimation at the red and the yellow circles. And there's underestimation at this um, purple, purple circle. Um, and when we compare the modified omega t metric um, for these models, we can see that Flow2D and DCLAW do, their, um, do the best, and they're quite similar, and RAMS does the worst. So I set up these simulations so that I sampled intentionally, so that I sampled a parameter space that spanned volumes that produced both 
very little inundation like that shown on the left and those that completely over inundate the steady region. So these maps give you a sense of the variation in, in inundation area that's produced. So the next thing we're gonna do is look at how total volume influences the simulation results. First, we're gonna look at the declaw model. And on the right is a plot that we'll see a few times. So on the y-axis is our misfit metric where low values are good and high values are bad. Um, and the y-axis is the log of the total volume increasing to the right. So we might expect our low and high inundation extent examples to plot in the upper left and upper right. So before showing the results, I want to think about what we might expect this relationship to look like. So at both low and high volumes, we'd expect um, poor performance. And this event has already occurred. So we have an estimate of the sediment that was deposited. This is really only an estimate. Um, for example, some material we know washed into the ocean. Still the volume of sediment deposited places a rough lower bound on the total volume of moving material, sediment and water for this event. And we can constrain the upper bound for this by bulking the quantity of sediment with a, a rather low sediment concentration. So we might expect good performance somewhere between these uh, two gray areas. Um, I'd like to place this sort of half-built diagram in the context of what kind of information we have before an event. So the hazard assessments um, that are constructed by my colleagues in the USGS um, produce estimates of sediment volumes that are a function of the 15-minute rainfall intensities. And these um, assessments consider design storms between 12 and 24 millimeters an hour. Um, the most commonly used rainfall intensity for planning is, um, sorry, 12 and 40 um, millimeters an hour. The most common design storm for planning is 24 millimeters an hour. And based on the prior day's forecast, the best information we had was um, about 29 millimeters an hour. The observed intensity for this event was actually around 84 millimeters an hour. So these vertical bars, I want to note, represent sediment volume, not total volume. And so thus we'd expect the total volume of moving material to be um, a bit higher. So, the pre-event uncertainty in volume is reflecting uncertainty in rainfall, uncertainty in um, converting rainfall to sediment volume, and uncertainty in sediment concentration. So it's pretty large. Um, so again, let's revisit this question of what we might expect this relationship to look like. Probably something like this. Now we're going to plot every sim simulation as an individual dot. The best simulation is, is at this blue star. And I think this looks a bit like a cat's breakfast, but some clarity can be gained when we color the dots by sediment concentration. So we can see that our largest volumes come from small sediment concentrations, um, that there's a large uh, range of total volumes that yield equally good results in the extent. So, you know, large, less flowable or small, more flowable. Um, um, uh, uh, simulations and that as the volume decreases, the range of the extent misfit metric becomes larger. And this is because the extent of a low volume event is very sensitive to how flowy the material is. So in the last few minutes, um, let's look at what this looks like for the other models. First, we'll do flow 2D. The layout here is the same as before with the blue star, again, representing the best simulation. And we can see, um, we can see a simpler relationship than we saw for declaw, this U-shape where the misfit increases away from a central range of volumes with good um, performance. We see that low, at lower volumes, there is a larger scatter, similar to declaw reflecting variation in other material properties. Finally, let's look at RANS. Here we see a very different picture 
Um, RAMs only simulate the extent well when the simulated volumes are much lower than reasonable for this event. And we see that it has broadly similar scatter across all volumes. We can put all three of these plots together uh, and see um, just how different the pattern is for each of these models. And I think that this sort of information really helps constrain the behavior of these three models and, and to understand the abilities and limits for using them in a, a hypothetical predictive context and for assessing you know, how well do they do at simulating this um, phenomenon. So I would say in the case of this uh, case study in conclusion, um, we can simulate this event well. We can use this intermodel comparison approach. You know, here we didn't use a, a formal calibration, but we're looking at sort of the best model from a, a set of samples. Um, and we can um, conclude that flow to D and D-claw um, are, are similar in their ability to simulate the event, um, but we can reject, in this case, RAMS um, in its ability to simulate the, the extent. Um, and so then digging into uh, the relationship between the inundation extent and the total volume, um, we saw that um, each model is gonna depend on volume differently and that the other material properties, those other inputs, become especially important when we have low volume. So um, to sort of conclude the two-part version of this talk, um, hopefully I have demonstrated to you that we can use these sort of model analysis methods to interrogate our models in, in, in many different ways. Um, we probably need well-constrained initial and boundary conditions uh, for these sorts of um, studies. And so I think it's a, a challenge to us to look for those and find those, especially over long tectonic um, time frames. Uh, but I, you know, I think integrating with the sedimentary record is an exciting area for thinking about um, that um, and, and inferring things about um, our, our boundary conditions. Um, we can assess how uncertainty is propagating into our, um, into our models and through them in uh, exploring predictions. And, you know, I, I want to end with two things that are, are sort of a challenge to the community, which is, I think, we don't really know the best ways to um, compare our models and data and to combine data of different types. So, um, you know, integrating, integrating um, topographic and geologic, uh, geochronologic and other data. And then, you know, I've just shown two examples. Um, and I, I don't think we really know how transferable these results are. You know, I don't think that the, um, it's, not, it's not immediately obvious to me that the sort of ingredients necessary to um, capture the, the Western upstate New York I, you know, I would not say that those are always going to be the most um, important ingredients of complexity, uh, but we can only know that by trying these sorts of numerical experiments in other places. So with that, I'm happy to take questions, um, and I'd like to acknowledge my many collaborators on each of these um, portions that I um, have really enjoyed working with, as well as a variety of funding sources. Katie, thanks for a great talk. Um, I just want to remind everyone, if you have questions for Katie, please type them into the um, Q&A. Um, and while I'm waiting for, for those to appear, I actually have one question myself, Katie. So, you know, you, you gave this really great description of inner comparison of data and models. In the first part, one thing I was interested in was you talked about breaking your domain up into these different chunks, and then you did the comparison in those different chunks, but you didn't really explain, how did you choose the specific regions in the domain? And 
you did all these parameter tests, exactly this figure here, but I was wondering whether your misfit scores are also sensitive to these choices about how you're doing the, where you're doing the comparison. That's a, that's a great question. So um, we, in, in, the, in the case, okay, there, there are a couple of layers to this. One, we wanted to make this, we didn't want to like hand draw this figure. Um, so what we did, um, we used um, this um, chi metric. So it, it's sort of, sort of a measure of where you are in the drainage network. Um, and elevation. So we basically chopped our domain into um, chi elevation um, bands by um, like quantile. And, uh, and, and if anyone else wants to do something like this, it's implemented in this Umami software package that it was published in JOS and that we used along with Terrain Bento and Land Lab. Um, and so in this case, we used this, um, we used elevation and chi to chunk up our domain into sort of patches that we felt like were, um, I don't know, like that put the weight correctly on sort of the process domain. So like all of these areas here in blue, you know, there should they should be. Um, behaving pretty similarly. And so we, we don't want them to be weighted by the number of pixels. We want them sort of to be a unit. And one of the things that we did in the sensitivity analysis was actually look at how a variety of, um, uh, of sort of the sensitivity of each of these different patches to um, the different inputs. And that allowed us to sort of see how there are there were certain inputs that really influence, say, only the lower portions of the domain, and um, certain ones that influence the upper portions of of the domain. And and so one of the things that I learned, we, another thing we did in the the sensitivity analysis was think about a whole range of topographic um, sort of statistical metrics that um, you might hope would be a good way to compare models and data. Um, but in our case, we were never really able to combine them in a way that we felt like could um, uh, sort of reflected good performance. Um, so, so I think um, one of the things that's really interesting about these sorts of uh, studies is really digging into which aspects of the your data, in this case, we have topography, are sensitive to different inputs. And, and to be open to the fact that it's, that it's probably going to depend on what your output is, what you choose. And so, you know, I think that these sorts of methods are really exciting that they force us to be honest about exactly how we're being subjective in saying what is important and saying what good good is. Great, thanks. That, does that answer? Yeah, no, definitely. I mean, it's a challenging problem and to figure out, you know, and um, and so you have all these choices, not just the choices of the parameters, but then of how you even do the comparison in the first place. Um, a couple of questions that have come in on the Q&A. Um, first from um, Carlos Laverde. Um, Katie, great talk. Do you know between these three models that you evaluated, which of these models can reproduce better in its simulations the effects in the flow behavior of the big boulders usually transported by de debris flow matrix? That's a great question. I, 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 I guess I would start to ask, answer it by saying that none of these models is really uh, that uh, complex in its representation of grain size. So, um, you know, flow 2D and RAMs as single phase models are going to completely ignore grain size. Um, but um, DCLAW, it, 
it sort of has an effective grain size that's more related to sort of how um, interstitial fluid is, is, is moving. Um, but my colleague at the survey, Ryan Jones, is, is working on better representing segregation in, in declaw. Um, and so I, I think what I would say is that, um, you know, none of them are really going to represent the big boulders. Um, but the only one we might ever expect to represent the big boulders um, in an explicit way is, is declaw. And if there's a follow-up to that, I'm happy to answer it if, if Carlos enters it in the chat. Yeah, great. Um, we have another question uh, from uh, Jeremy Maurer. You mentioned that it's not well known how to choose reasonable objective functions, in particular with multiple types of data in these problems. Are there specific types of work slash experiments that you think would shed light on this issue? That's, that's a great question. I, so I have two thoughts on that topic. The first is, um, you know, I think, you know, the, the first step is to just try and do these sorts of studies in as many different areas as, um, as possible and to sort of see what looks as if it works for um, constructing um, or sort of interrogating the possible ingredients of an objective function there. Um, and, and to sort of get a sense, you know, across different, you know, geologic domains, um, climactic domains, if there are patterns. The other thing that I'm excited to start exploring is sort of multi-objective um, opt optimization. So, you know, really what we ended up finding as a major challenge in doing this work is um, when you have a lot of different data types and you want to combine them, you know, you really can only combine them if you know how to normalize them appropriately. And sort of like in theory, that normalization is, um, you know, should be something like the measurement error. But it, in these sorts of modeling studies, it also, well, one, you may not know what the like sort of effective measurement error is, but you also probably need to incorporate things like how well do you really expect the model to approximate the, the output, which is, I, I would argue, close to unknowable. Um, but by using a multi-objective optimization approach, you, you don't have to put all the different ingredients onto the same um, sort of framework. On, you don't need to normalize them. You can really see what the trade-offs between them are. So, you know, I think those two things, you know, try this type of thing in more places, and you know, really continue to interrogate the properties of the objective functions are the, the two main ways that I would, I'm excited to go about doing this. We're a little past the hour, but I think we'll take this one last question and then wrap up. This is um, from Risa Maddow. Thanks, Katie, very interesting talk. Is downslope variance in porosity and infiltration included or assumed in volume change? Is it something that would factor into how well the process is modeled? Um, is this, can you quickly type, I, I presume this is talking about the debris flow example. Um, so, you know, like is, is debris flow material, is any of the water infiltrating? Um, and so I, I can say that's not, that's not being considered actively in, um, okay, good. I see that I, I inferred correctly. Um, that's not something that is actively being evaluated in the numerical experiments that I showed today. Um, but, you know, I, I definitely think that um, in terms of entrainment of material, Entrainment of subsequent material, um, thinking about um, 
sort of what the soil water content is going downstream um, would be important. That's another sort of more carefully representing erodible material is something that um, another colleague is working on in, in thinking about sort of a declaw variant. Um, and so, yeah, I think that's, I think we don't yet have the ability to really test that, um, but you know, to the extent that that is changing how erodible um, material is, I, I definitely think it's, it's possible. One thing, you know, this, this question, you know, thoughtfully brings up um, a thing that I skipped over in the sort of setup of these debris flow um, example, this debris flow um, case study I gave, which is that in our case, we're not permitting, you know, there's a volume of moving material. Um, we can let it deposit, but we're not really letting it um, in, tra in train. And, and I think my impression from looking at some of the topographic data at the um, for this event is that there definitely was some material that was in train. I think it's probably pretty small relative to the um, um, sort of material that exited the upstream catchments. Great. Well, thank you very much, Katie. I also want to just take this opportunity to thank all of our speakers from this week's webinar series. It's been a um, really stimulating uh, set of talks on thinking about this coupling between surface processes and deeper earth um, processes. And, uh, you know, I appreciate everyone taking their time. We've had a great turnout. And um, I hope you all have a great rest of your afternoon or evening or wherever you are.